Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. <laughs> We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom. You're listening to Double Feature. My name is Eric, and I'm here with teenage Nosferatu pussy Michael Kester. <laughs> and uh, we have a show today that I feel like is kind of comfort food. What are the, the movies we're doing on the show? Uh, today we're doing Maniac and Intruder. Um, back to the old uh, slasher roots of our now incredibly heady Double Lynch, Double Feature <laughs> podcast. Yeah, although I still think there's a lot of stuff to say about Maniac and Intruder. There, um, there's definitely going to be some spoilers in here, but you can use the chapters, as you probably know, to skip over the spoilers. Mm -hmm. This is a really good week to do this. I could use a little uh, comfort food slash yeah. a double feature, because, uh, Michael, I have to tell you, I am fucking terrified over our Kickstarter. I told you, I told you going into it, man, Kickstarter it is gives the... Me terror inside most stressful month you will ever have oh in your God. entire life there's a couple of really cool things on there we haven't talked about it a lot on our actual show because there's so much stuff over there mm -hmm. the big additional thing would be that people are going to get to pick some of these films finally which everybody's excited about that's one of the incentives which i think is a big deal no it is right because we're essentially agreeing to just doing whatever they pick so you know, I, I could probably guess a few of the things people are going to pick, but Blade Runner. if you go to the Kickstarter page and you make a pledge, email us and, you know, if you're going to do the one for picking a film, email us and let us know what you're going to pick. Because the right now there's so much terror and excitement in me that I would also just love to know what people are. I'm really curious about it. What do people want us to do on the show that, you know, if we hit the goal? What's their incentive pick going to be? Blade Runner. I love that. Blade Runner. But also, we haven't talked really about additional content at all. You want to kind of give me your pitch for that? Well, so we've we've got a lot. The format of our show is terribly flawed. <laughs> um, believe it or not, Podmanity, we're not sure exactly how we got to this situation. But as much as Eric and I like to pretend that the best way to watch a film is with a second film right behind it. <laughs> right, right. Um, based solely on the notion of a film that came out in 2004 uh, with Rodriguez and Tarantino back to backing to exploitation movies. Yeah. There are things like Star Wars, things like Back to the Future and Evil Dead. These things are in sixes and 23s. Or trilogies. Some of them are horror. Some of them are not horror. So the additional content is basically a situation wherein we do shows that don't fit the format of what we've created on Double Feature. Because we can't do a Killapalooza of Star Wars. Right. We can't do it. We can't do all the Star Trek films. So we're going to do these kind of secret bonus episodes in addition to the normal shows we would do anyways. Um, we want to do these additional content shows, which would be just for the people who help fund the Kickstarter. Right. So there's an option. There's uh, one incentive option to just get access to all the additional content. So you get the normal, you know, uh, episodes that you get every fucking week. But every few weeks or whatever, one of these additional content episodes, depending on how many we do, would come out and you would have exclusive access to it, which is pretty cool. But there's also an option where you can actually pick what the additional content is. Yeah. And uh, because we need a lot of money to do the show, I wanted to follow your model of, you know, convince Glitter Mouse to, I don't know, do whatever weird thing, as many weird things as people sign up for. <laughs> We're basically going to do uh, as much additional content as, you know, people uh, pledge for those requests. So, I mean, if the entire thing gets funded through additional content incentives, we might do as many shows of those as the normal weekly episodes, I guess. Right. But yeah, there's an option to choose those too. So there's a lot of cool stuff over there. It's kickstarter.doublefeatureshow.com. And um, that's going to have even more up-to-date information about how the fuck we're doing than these shows are. Yeah. I'm just, I'm, uh, I mean, I'm excited about it. 
and I'm glad to be learning about Kickstarter, and I think we have a lot of really good ideas for it. But the idea that it might not get funded and we might be in the last couple episodes of our show ever is fucking mortifying. It's hard for me to even talk about. Yeah. This is something we've been doing a really, really long time. And it's uh, it's like one of the most important things in my life, which is weird. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's a, it's an internet yeah, podcast, I, but I, know. I mean, everything I look at in my life is through the lens of double feature. We talk about movies that we would have watched anyway, and suddenly now it's our own child. Right. So we're coming down to the last couple episodes. The website is kickstarter.doublefeatureshow.com. And we would very much love to uh, keep doing the show. So all the details about that are on there. But we really need everybody to just uh, go make a pledge. Check out the details, make a pledge, and help this thing keep existing. Anyways, we should roll right into Maniac. Yeah. Which is a movie about a young man looking for love in all the wrong places, I think. No? Um, this is one of those good old, you know, Herschel Gordon Lewis blood films, man. Oh, yeah. I remember uh, when we talked about The Last Blood Feast and all the Herschel Gordon Lewis stuff before that is the kind of style and you know being captivated by this breed of gore exploitation film and i think this is one of the first things i've seen that truly felt like right i mean i don't know that i would have believed if you told me herschel gordon lewis made it but it, it really felt like that era that sure. place right it might be the blood color it might be the poor exposure i don't know but I, one of the things that sets this apart is it's also a really ambitious movie. Yeah. There's a lot of uh, overhead shots of the city from a shaky helicopter. You know, they clearly just rented a helicopter or something, took a sky tour yeah. and filmed from it. Uh, not to mention all the psychology stuff we'll get to, but I'm trying to find a spot for Maniac in the slasher history I have. And I'm wondering, you know, you've seen uh, still, even as much as I love this stuff and watch it all the time, I think you've still seen more of these movies than I have. Yeah, I've seen way too many. Where do you think this, I mean, what in the genre is this similar to and what kind of makes it stand out from the genre? The, the film that this seems most similar to to me is, is the original My Bloody Valentine. Sure. The, um, the whole... I mean, the, the level of violence. Do you remember when we did My Bloody Valentine, how we uh, were talking about it had to get, all the violence had to get cut out? Right. Um, but if you actually watch the scenes with the violence, it's it's pretty graphic. Yeah. Especially for, you know, 80s slasherdom. Sure. And Maniac has that level of gravity to the, to the slashing. It's not Jason 6, haha, smiley face on a tree. Right. It's not voodoo it's not coming back for revenge it's really just um it's it's the gravity of murder um but i think what sets it apart is that we follow the killer with a face i mean it's it's not first person uh camera who sneaks up behind people right and stabs them to death it's it's this actor joe spinell who I mean, we, we, he is identified as the killer within the first few minutes of the film, and then we proceed to follow him throughout the film. Sure. So even in these larger franchise movies that are very much about the killer, it's a guy with a mask. It's something kind of supernatural. It's something that looks, uh, that doesn't look anything like the people who are watching the movie. Right. In um, the My Bloody Valentine and all, what I like to think in my head as the one-offs in sure. slasher history. Yeah. Most of the time we talk about slasher history, it's the franchises. But the um, what I know you affectionately refer to as the terror train uh, slasher yeah. movies. <laughs> when I think about those, they're they're never personal movies. It's right. the same kind of thing. It's um, it turns out to be someone, or the killer didn't really matter. And this is a movie that I think of the stuff we watched on the show it makes me think about henry portrait of a serial kill serial killer a lot yeah you know it's that kind of we're following the killer the whole time mm -hmm. and uh we get an inner monologue from the killer that's very weird i mean that was the titular concept of henry was we're gonna follow this guy and we're gonna try and get some insight into why he does the things he does sure although i mean that 
that doesn't really have the stylistic makeup of a lot of the slasher movies we saw. Right. I guess you might consider Henry a slasher movie. I don't know. I think a lot of people do. So we're seeing into his life from the opening title sequence. You know, he wakes up in the bed, uh, just light streaming across his eyes, screaming. There's the bloody mannequin in his, yeah. in his bed. It's a weird little room, too. You know, it's a purple room. There's all these candles everywhere. Yeah. And uh, mm -hmm. the red titles on there. It's a very striking scene. It's all set up in a way that's just immediately off-putting. Yeah, right. You never... And, and I think part of it is because of the the uh, caliber of film um, as far as the production quality goes. Mm -hmm. I think that lends itself so strongly to just preventing you from comfortably viewing the film sure and that room is the perfect stage for everything to get set up on because immediately every question is raised and meanwhile you're following the character who wakes up in that room yeah that character that room is nothing to him yeah he's not surprised or afraid of it every question in that room he knows the answer to sure. but he has no need to talk about it right and now you have to follow this guy who that room is fine with yeah, and the fact that you come back means you should be mining it for clues. Right. I think you're supposed to be looking around going, why are what's the head in the bed? Oh, it's a mannequin. Why are there all these mannequins everywhere? Why do we keep going back to the mannequins? What is the tiny TV with a bunch of static on it? Yeah. You know, most of these are probably just aesthetic elements, but uh, something like the mannequins, we start to get into a lot as we explore... You know, who is this character? Why is he doing what he does? You told me, actually, um, right after we saw this, that the actor who plays the killer we've seen on the show before. Yes. And I've been racking my brain, and I know I'm going to feel stupid, but I have no idea who that is. He's, uh... What's his name? The actor's name is Joe Spinell. Mm-hmm. Um, but you may recognize him as Rocky's old boss. I was just going to work for the mob. <laughs> I was just going to say the Rocky <laughs> franchise for some reason. Yeah. And I have no idea why I was going to pick that. Yeah. Do you remember early? I think it's in the first film early on the limo pulls up and. Oh rolls, yeah. Yeah. And Joe Spinell's wow. sitting inside perfectly adjusted. Weird. Trying to beg Rocky to come back to the. Well, light. there was my problem. I was going through and going, he's not in any of the child's play movies. Mm -hmm. was it <laughs> Children of the corn. I blacked out for most of the Amityville horror. Did he maybe play the lamp? <laughs> but in fact, from the Rocky films. Well, yeah. good fucking thing we did the Rocky movies on here. Otherwise, right. I'd have no context for uh, this actor's career. Well, he's also in Star Crash. Oh, sure. He's in Star Crash, and, and one of the other actors from Star Crash was in this film. And that's all. So the, the reason uh, that, that I want to mention him is because this is basically his baby. Mm -hmm. Maniac is a movie Joe Spinell created. Um, he wrote it, came up with the core concept, kind of, I mean... As much as his name isn't, you know, in the as a director or producer credit, he had all this work to do with the film. Sure. And uh, it, it's weird thinking of a character in Rocky coming up with something this dark and twisted. Sure. As I mean, when you think of the kind of care and attention that this guy paid to Maniac you start getting this weird image of, wow, he's really into this idea. Sure, <laughs> sure. Where is the line drawn? Is he really this weird of a guy or does he really like horror movies? Because those are the only options. Yeah. He either thinks this is a drama or he loves slasher movies. Right, right. Well, what puts it in that weird spot is the, um, the psychology element of it. Oh, yeah. The fact that we're so involved in what's going on in the killer's head. and you know, all the mannequin stuff. And I think this might be our first instance of a doll or mannequin obsessed killer. You know, that's almost a little bit of a cliche right now. Yeah, but sure. Uh, when you think back, I, I don't know. That's another good double feature show at gmail.com. Are there any doll obsessed killers before Maniac? Or was this, you know, kind of where that came from? The mannequins don't even seem so bad. Until he's fucking hammering scalps to them, right? <laughs> and then it starts to starts to get a little gory. 
but it's funny. I mean, just as I was wondering uh, why all these mannequins all over the place and kind of convincing myself, look, the movie doesn't owe me any reason. You can just have, that can be a sure. a weird killer thing. He just likes mannequins. That's kind of how uh, movies it's, do it now. It's always really funny in, in slasher films when we get these one-offs or, or films that, that haven't built a solid franchise around them because you take maniac and you have this guy who nails scalps to mannequins and you and I sit there and go, well, why is he doing this? I right, need an explanation. Right. This is kind of silly. Meanwhile, we go back and watch Child's Play knowing there are four other films. <laughs> sure. And they go, it's a killer who voodooed his body into a toy. Oh, sure. Clearly. And we go, we go well, yeah, there's five of them. Of course, that's the plan. <laughs> right. that's, that's what's going on. Right. There's five. Why, why would I, I wasn't asking. Right. I just know the doll kills people. But I've accepted that because it's on five different DVD covers at my local video sure. store. Frank eventually gets this opportunity to explain why he loves dolls so much <laughs> in kind of this uh, this longer chunk of the movie where he has this strange ability to tidy up and look like a photographer. Right. He almost becomes a spy for a little while. It just can act like a completely normal uh, person. Reminds me of Gilbert Godfrey can do all these different impressions, can make his voice sound like anything chooses the Gilbert Godfrey voice as his right. normal voice. Right. That's how our slasher is. But his uh, his big excuse is that, you know, when talking about the photography, it's the same thing. They don't change. They're perfectly preserved mm -hmm. uh, people, perfectly preserved women. The focus on that psychology reminds me of the Dementia 13 sort of era of, you know, Roman Polanski movies and uh, Psycho, some of the Hitchcock stuff before that. All of that 60s stuff we talked about in the Dementia 13 episode of, hey, psychology, that's going to be the hook. Right. That's the dark. Of course, you know, we're talking about psychology. We're doing a horror movie. Those are just the same fucking thing. Right. As if people expected you, you know, psychology turns out to be the killer at the end of the movie. And I think this goes back to a lot of that stuff. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So he's a painter for that long because the movie wants to explain all that to us. But it's a lot different look at a killer than the usual madman who's barely able to to contain himself. Right. This is somebody who's a little more uh, deliberate. He has purpose in what he's doing. In order to get to the ends he wants, he could, you know, dress up like somebody else and pretend to be them, uh, hide his own crazy for a prolonged period of time. Frank's not the only one I want to talk about, though. I'm dying to talk about Tom Savini. Oh, yeah. That's really one of... young, goofy haircut, mustache, uh, Tom Savini. So we constantly end up mentioning Tom Savini on this show, and, and we've seen him now. I mean, from Dust Till Dawn, he's in Machete, he's in everything Rodriguez, he's in 50% of everything Tarantino. Sure. And we, every once in a while, see a young Tom Savini. Mm hmm. And I always think, ah, there we go. There's the Tom Savini roots. And then two months go by and we see a younger Tom Savini. Right. Right. Um, Where does it all and, begin? Yeah. I mean, I, I have this I have this theory that we're going to get back to some some silent movie in the 20s and there's going to be a little baby with a goofy mustache sure. and the, the monster makeup is going to be impeccable. Right. <laughs> right. Well, here we're seeing Tom Savini. I mean, this is such a great thing. He's playing the teenager that he ends up doing the makeup for all the right. time later in his career, and probably at that time sure. too. You know, he is the teen trying to get some. Uh, I want to meet you somewhere. You know, in the back seat. Sure. And the killer runs up on his car and blows his fucking head off. Yeah, I mean, blows his head apart. Really? Akin to scanners. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Scanners was probably the other one. By the same method, really. Is it? Well, I mean, if you... if Because we, we talked about scanners um, being... Uh, did we talk about scanners? Yeah, sure. The, the sh okay. shotgun to the bag of <laughs> animal right. parts. I mean, and that's what we're seeing, is we're seeing a shotgun to a head. Yeah. Um, but what's actually really interesting about the makeup of this scene... And it speaks to the general makeup of the entire film is uh, it's actually there are two two specific points about the scene that make it one of my favorite things I've ever seen in Slasherdom. And one is that the only reason Tom Savini is the 
actor who plays that role is because he had already made a cast of his own head. Sure. That's what I because figured. Because he's, he's a makeup guy. Right. So he already had one and they didn't have to pay for him to make a new one. So he, uh, he, they already had a Tom Savini head cast that they could then just make a model of and then blow it apart. Sure. Um, but the other thing that's really interesting about this scene and the film is that they never got permits to shoot outdoors. Oh, really? So that explains why everything seems really sneaky and <laughs> guerrilla type filmmaking sure. and shaky. But this scene in particular is awesome because Tom Savini was the only one who I guess was either qualified or willing to operate a gun. Right. So that's actually Tom Savini who jumps up on the hood of the car and blows his own head <laughs> off. Sure. That's great. And that is is compounded by the fact that because they didn't want to get arrested, they had their production assistant sit in a car that was running just out of frame with the trunk open. Mm -hmm. And then another production assistant stands next to the trunk. So now imagine from outside the car, this is what you're seeing. You're seeing Tom Savini run up, jump onto the hood of a car, blow his own head off. And then immediately when the director says cut, pitch the shotgun into the trunk of a nearby car, a production assistant slams it shut and that car goes driving off. <laughs> That's good. So that if the police show up to investigate the gunshot, there is no evidence. Oh, that's funny. Yeah, I've never seen a movie show off a single burst of gore more than this. <laughs> it's frame by frame slow motion. You know, they're blowing this head wide open and it's so slow. It's like you're watching a slideshow of them uh, <laughs> yeah. of them do it. The one other thing in Maniac, though, that stands out to me a lot is that ending. Yeah. The 80s slasher stuff is so often notorious for its terrible endings. Yes. And I think this has to be uh, one of the better ones or maybe even one of my favorites it's um, one of the better know, first. So you're going to have to clarify one of the better <laughs> terrible endings or one of the better endings. I mean, for me, those are all the same thing, right? Okay. But sure. I actually <laughs> think this is a really good ending. Okay. I think it's a good ending because um, it's, there's a lot of unexpected stuff and the way they kind of wrap it back into reality. I like a lot. So at first you get the mom rising from the grave, unexpected thing. Mm -hmm. And you know, I like that just because it completely throws you off from everything else that's going on in the movie, but still sort of plays into the themes of sure perfectly preserved women and, you know, all of the psychological stuff. Right. But then that in the head look at the character allows for the surprising moment at the very end when he goes home. That's something you wouldn't be able to do in other slasher movies. You're actually following this character around. So, oh, naturally, you're going back to his house. You go there all the time. Right. And the mannequins become the victims and attack him and tear his fucking head off, which is so bizarre and just upsetting, surreal, unexpected, whatever kind yeah. of verbiage you want to you want to throw at it. But uh, after that. So that's enough. Right. I mean, I would mm -hmm. I'd take that and you can cut to credits and that's fine. And. When a, when a movie does something like this and doesn't immediately go to credits, I go, well, that was a mistake. Yeah. That's clearly where you should end. <laughs> but it takes just enough time after that scene to kind of have this moment that pushes it back over into a naturalistic interpretation. Sure. The cops find his body with his head still on, kind of leads you to believe he, you know, went home and had another nightmarish uh, right. vision, which, allow, which allows the whole thing to stay in natural territory which says more about being inside the character's head and which delivers this strange revenge retribution scene you get in a lot of slasher movies of the final girl, but with all the victims of our main character in a way you would never see coming. I mean, how could yeah. you get a better ending than that? I, yeah, and I, and I love that, that in, the, in the very, very, very tale of the film, the cops, they don't call it in. They just go, oh, <laughs> what, a, what a weirdo. <laughs> right. And right. kind of just walk out and they're like, ah, somebody on the next shift will probably pick this up. We'll look to Intruder and see uh, what it has to offer in regard to this. Is this a double cop finale, double feature? It might be. It might be. Um, if we were to play the recommendation game on this one, I think uh, for fans of Intruder, maybe Suavi's uh, Stage Fright. Oh, yeah. Remember that? Oh, yeah. 
that uh, very much feels like what's going on. And you're kind of locked in a single place. People are being bumped yep. off one by one. The cameras are uh, ridiculous, dramatic, and goofy. Wow, I didn't even think of that, but that's definitely yeah. true as well. I mean, absolutely. The camera work in this film is is some of the most silly and exploitative camera work. So talk about talk about having the uh, the whole thing where the previous film follows an actual character, mm -hmm. um, and he's walking around, and you see his face. <laughs> sure. This movie, this movie, the camera does it. It not only exploits the oh yeah, we've all seen slasher movies. Let's have the camera be the killer. But sometimes it's we've all seen slasher movies. Let's have the camera be a ceiling fan. Right. Yeah. I mean, let's have the camera sure. be on the floor for no reason, sure. but still move like it's in a first person kind of. They just start fucking with every preconceived well, so idea ridiculous. of how slasher films work. The camera is inside a shopping cart. You get a shopping cart right? perspective. You get uh, inside a rotary phone, I think, is the yeah. most ridiculous yeah. one. But <laughs> under a broom being swept over. I mean, there's it's really nowhere just... the camera will not go. But it's goofy because it's it's automatically it goes, well, we've all seen slasher movies. This might be that. <laughs> right. Sometimes. <laughs> right, who knows? Yeah, so the things that are going to be really important to me about Intruder are the things it does differently than a lot of these. Oh, yeah. But also, strangely, the things it does uh, the same because of who's involved with this film. Right. So first, there's uh, Scott Spiegel. Yeah. Who wrote Evil Dead 2 with Sam Raimi and kind of acts in a lot of his movies. Sure. Uh, you know where else, actually, um, we talked about some Scott Spiegel stuff. Uh, you and I off the air, I guess was Hostel 3, the direct-to-video sequel of uh, Eli Roth's fantastic Hostel films. How is he responsible for Hostel 3? He directed it. He also did the sequel to the, uh, it might have been another direct-to-video thing, of uh, From Dust Till Dawn, speaking of Tom Savini. Two or three? The second one. Okay. What is that, Texas Blood Money? Texas Blood Money. So we're going to look at Scott Spiegel's work in this, but I'm interested in the intersection with uh, Scott and Sam and Ted. Yeah. So Sam Raimi is actually an actor in this film, which is right. kind of cool. He plays Randy. Yeah. I saw Randy and immediately went, oh, Ted Raimi, because you always see Ted Raimi in things. Sure. <laughs> but it's um, it's Sam who's the butcher. And then Ted is, what's his name? Produce Joe, I think. Produce Joe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah who's just rocking out to his headphones all the time, you know, when he's told he's fired and Yes. The whole movie is listening to five a five second loop of music, <laughs> right? Which is great. And and I don't know if this is the same for you, Eric, but when you see Ted Raimi in a movie, especially now, but at any time, mm -hmm. do you automatically go, "Oh, well, someone's gonna die," right? <laughs> right. I just go, "Well, when does Ted Raimi die?" Oh, he's listening to music all the time. I wonder if that'll be his demise. Ted Raimi could walk into a fucking we've seen that before right we've seen ted raimi just walk into movies and die immediately <laughs> just like yeah. i'm ted raimi die yeah but i just mean ted raimi ted raimi could walk into some sandra bullock rom-com <laughs> right and i'll just be like i didn't know this was that kind of movie <laughs> right <laughs> right when's he gonna get decapitated when's his eye it, gonna yeah, get poked out it's not just it's not just ted raimi is in your film oh he's going to get cancer it's Ted Raimi's in your film, a gargoyle is going to fall off a building <laughs> and crush his face. Oh, God. I get so much joy out of seeing Ted Raimi because I know what it means. <laughs> yeah. You know, there's some actors you go, oh, he's in this. I really like that guy. Or, you yeah. know, I can pretend he's the candy man or you sure. know, whatever. Right. But, man, you see Ted Raimi and you just go, oh, oh, this kind of movie. It's yeah. one of those movies. Exactly. Yeah. It's a Ted Raimi film. It's kind of like when you see Sean Bean in a movie. You go, right. okay, well, at least the ending has been spelled out. Let's see how we get there. So I don't think I'm forcing this comparison because, you know, it's Sam Raimi in the movie. And maybe I am. I don't know. Give me your take, though. It, doesn't it seem like this is the kind of movie that Sam Raimi shot? You know what I mean? It does. It does. There's that I thing mean... we talked about on the Gummo show about uh, Harmony Corinne. Yep. Right? Yeah. I mentioned the association between Harmony Corinne and Larry Clark. Right, who did And kids. you were, yeah, you were kind of surprised at the time because you went, oh, I don't think Larry Clark has anything to do with Gummo. And he doesn't. Right. But I saw these similarities between Gummo and kids and wondered, you know, how did Larry Clark influence Harmony Corinne? 
you think that's going on here? I mean, yeah. why does it look like a Sam Raimi movie? These I mean, guys all hang out. It just rubs off. I think, yeah. I mean, if you have, you got to think about it as in, I mean, these are people, right? These are human beings. Mm-hmm. And above, above that, they're creative types. So per, here, let's take a really good example for just you and I. There's the Glitter Mouse song, um, Porn Stars and Promises. Sure. The one that you wrote the baseline to. Yeah. So I had kind of come up with the initial idea for it. And I was really excited because it was really trip hoppy. And I was like, here, here's this thing I wrote. Isn't this awesome? Right. And you're way more into trip hop than I ever have been. So I send it to you and I go, this sounds like trip hop, right? And you're like, well, yeah, but (laughs) this will make it sound more like trip hop. And you send one bass line back and I go, oh, yeah. (laughs) And immediately. Right. Now, now, what's really interesting about that is if you listen to the version of that song before your bass line, uh-huh. you would just go, oh, yeah, that kind of sounds similar to a Glitter Mouse song. Sure. But now your bass line's on it and people will listen to it and go, that sounds a little bit like the double feature theme. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, I guess I could see that. Yeah. And um, and it becomes a Glitter Mouse song. And, you know, your um, your bassist, uh, Jeremy, really spruced that thing up to the point where I don't even feel OK taking credit for it. <laughs> But under there somewhere is something that feels a little bit like part of the double feature theme. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I guess I could see that. I mean, when you put two creative people in a room and you ask them to both be involved in the same project, even though one of them is one of them is being directed by another, the person who has like the stronger experience in a realm, say Sam Raimi with goofy horror. Yeah. They're going to have suggestions and those suggestions are going to ring true to the other person sure. because they know that they have that experience. Sure, definitely. Well, so these shots that are, I mean, I, th- I think there's a couple things that are very Sam Raimi feeling, but nothing more so than the odd camera placement and shots. Sure. And I mean, you're Bruce right, Campbell. the goofy stuff. Do the shots actually do anything? Do you think they're just stylistic? I mean, what influence are they having on how you feel as you're watching the movie? I think, like I said, I think that a huge portion of Intruder is the betrayal of your average slasher film. Mm-hmm. We already get the uh, the weird final girl thing. Um, we get the uh, the uh, killer switch. We get the first person camera that isn't the killer. Yeah, right, <laughs> right. Well, because you have a first person camera, you feel like it's got to be the killer. It turns out it is just a bag of cocoa puffs. Sure. And, and I mean, you even get certain things like, man, those cereal won't stay on the shelf. And immediately, <laughs> right. the, st- the cereal won't stay on the shelf, Eric. And I'm sitting there going, uh-oh, the killer must be on top of the grocery store shelf. Yeah, poking the box of cereal. As if, as if, as if I'm, I'm sitting there going, I've seen plenty of these. I know what this means. Right. This means the killer is laying on top of the shelf, irritatingly poking <laughs> these cereal boxes, and then he's going to spring into murderous action. Oh, God, I love Intruder so much. <laughs> it just exploits everything that you know about slasher films and go, no, sometimes cereal boxes fall off shelves repeatedly right and it's not because there's a scary monster laying on top of the shelf sure well i think these came in uh to slasherdom because of you know a need to make people feel like they're being stalked yep um you have claustrophobic environments in slasher films and you have open environments a lot of slasher films are about you know jamie lee curtis is stuck in the closet and someone's coming to get her and then they're also about Jason is running through the woods. Right. So by having these point of view shots, it's just another sort of way to build tension and make it feel like, yeah, you might be in the open. But that was the big idea about, I mean, about the Halloween thing. That's the convention is Michael Myers just appears places because he's right. following you. I always go back to, um, this is a really obscure one, but do you recall in Halloween 5 when we get that scene? No, where... I recall nothing about Halloween right. 5. Where we get the scene where um, the, I can't remember her name, but uh, Lori's daughter is running through that field and Michael Myers is standing in the distance in the field and he starts walking into the field and then he just stops walking and watches her run away. And what's always surprised me about that feeling is she is running at breakneck child speed away from the killer and all he's got to do is be watching her. Mm Mm-hmm. And I get the feeling that she's not getting away. No, not at all. She's on a treadmill running off. Yeah. 
as long as he can see her, she can't get away from him. Yeah. Which is kind of, I think, another thing with being locked in this store. As long as the killer knows you're in the store. Yep. There's really no way. Sure. Even because if the killer knows you're there, they're going to know you're going to try to leave. And that's when they're going to impale you on a meat hook. Oh, man, the meat hook, the, you know, the stylistic parts of Intruder that I think are most unique and most its own are the deaths. Yeah. And they start out rather straightforward. You get that full moon shot over and over, which is another piece of uh, the style of the movie. Mm -hmm. But after a couple of these straightforward deaths, you finally get, you know, that first head press. It's like a, a pneumatic tube that's coming down and like crushing part of his head. Yeah. And then the receipt spike, which is just sure. since the first fucking time I saw a receipt spike, I just thought it was begging to be used as a execution device. I always think of a, of a receipt spike as um as like something that it seems just like an accident waiting to happen. Yeah. You look at it and go, someone's going to poke their eye out. Well, my feeling is someone's going to slam a receipt down on it like this way. Oh, yeah. With their hand flat. Sure, sure. And then they're going to get stuck to the receipt spike and then bleed all over the lamp. Right. And then the most infamous scene uh, from eyeball the movie. Olive. Which, no, not the eyeball olive. Although we see a lot of eyeball olives later in cinema, too. Uh, no, I was thinking of sawing the head in half. Oh, yeah. No. Well, and, I mean, and that's, that's a poster. It's a cover. You see that scene all the time. You know what's really weird about this film, and I was thinking about it, is you never get a clean decapitation. If somebody's head is being mangled, it's always somewhere between the eyes and mouth. Oh, sure. Um, it's it's in a place where you're sitting there going, that oh man, that's yeah. so much worse. Because you've we've seen the um the kill bill where you kind of just get part of your head sure. removed. <laughs> sure. We've seen uh, in in a million different movies, uh, you know, at the neck and then the head goes flying in right. slow motion and kids right. score a goal. Um, but what never ceases to make me cringe a little bit is when a face gets cut in half. Yeah. From ear to ear, not from. Yeah. From not Ichi. Yeah. Because there's so much in there. <laughs> right. I mean, there's bones oh, and man. teeth Ugh. and brains yeah. and, and your sinuses and your yeah. your eyeball nerves. Sure. I mean, between, well, and how between distinct, your... too, to go ear from ear. I mean, that's that's the intruder yeah. shot, you know? Sure. You can't do that without going, oh, you're talking about that thing from intruder. That That's, I mean, double points. Double points every time. I'm going to give the movie double points for one other thing, actually. Um You'd mentioned it, but the final girl thing. Yeah. The uh, This is my favorite idea from Intruder. It, so all these kids are, they're the overnight crew for this place. And uh, they just found out they're going to be fired or whatever. And they're all, you know, they're sweeping up, doing their jobs. And they're being picked off one by one. Mm -hmm. This is all very slasher format. Sure. But the final girl hasn't seen any of this. Right. If you shot the movie from the final girl's perspective, <laughs> she would just be hanging out at a cash register for the first hour and 20 minutes, and then she gets the whole movie at the very end. It's really unusual that it's, you know, the killer stalking her, but she doesn't really know. She's at the register hanging out. Sure. And all these people are dying around her, but it's not, ooh, what a mystery. They're getting picked off one by one. I could be next. She's completely oblivious to it. Sometimes you defy a convention like this just to defy it, and it's unique and interesting, but you find out the convention is what works. Right. But here, what this lets us do is revisit all the deaths right before the movie's over, which is something I totally want to do in other movies. Oh, yeah. You know, since she doesn't know what's going on until it's basically her turn, we get a tour allowing the movie to recap every single death scene, and... uh you know, go through and kind of touch the different bodies and see where they're laying, see where they wound up, see what the aftermath looks like to uh, some of the scenes that were so gory. We, you know, we cut away in the middle, use Randy's dead body to try and block a door on a meat hook. Right. You know? <laughs> All before another kind of convention defying thing, which is the very ending with the cops. Uh, Bruce Campbell and Lawrence Bender. Yeah. Um, probably... And oddly, um, 
maybe with the exception of Sam Raimi, uh, two of the most recognizable human beings that show up in the film. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, this is the scene that upsets everyone, right? Because it's right. Bruce Campbell's in the movie, but he's in the movie. For... Yeah, it's, he's on the cover. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He's in the movie for a few seconds, and there isn't even a big prize moment, a big look, everyone. We got Bruce Campbell because that, yeah. you know, I mean, it didn't mean anything yet. This is something no one really thinks about, but what I like beyond the cameos is the actual thing that's going on in that moment. The cops find them. And then they go, oh, wow, these uh, these lone survivors here killed everyone. We need right. to take them to jail. Right. <laughs> Which is something you really should think about in all of these movies, but it's suspension of disbelief. You never think about it. You never go, wow, the lone survivor uh, kind of looks like they murdered everyone <laughs> because they're the last person alive. But no, we always just cover them in a blanket and whisk them away, and then everything's fine. Right. All right, so that website was kickstarter.doublefeatureshow.com. I had a fucking blast watching Maniac and watching Intruder this week. Yeah, um, this this is this is is a good pair of slashers. Yeah, I don't want this to be our last slasher thing, and certainly I don't think uh, that, that last Killapalooza should be our last. I think we have more Killapaloozas in us. <laughs> so uh, there's so many good ones that we've been saving that we never got to. You know. Yeah kickstarter.doublefeatureshow.com so let's make that happen uh we have more movies we're doing next week though next time we're gonna do uh movies that end with um everything being okay uh we're going <laughs> to that out the end yeah we're going to do uh monsters ball and black snake mode and spoiling them already <laughs> watch more fucking film bye